thank you, Priscilla, for setting this up. And um, don't uh, I think I hear in your voice a, a sense of um, oh, remorse that maybe we don't have more folks here. Um, that's fine. As my wife, who's upstairs, would happily tell you, um, I can talk about this stuff anytime, anywhere, at any length, um, and happy to do so. Um, so if some other folks sign on later uh, via recording, amen to that. And in the meantime, um, we have kind of um, between you and Goss, we have uh, someone who's already experienced inpatient work, someone who's been focusing on psychiatry for perhaps a bit longer. And Goss, you had your um, basically the didactic portion, the lecture introduction to psychiatry. Um, you haven't had a chance to see patients yet. Um, so I'm going to kind of think of the, the two of you as like bookending um, the uh, the territory they may, might want to cover and pay attention to both ends at the same time. And with that, I might just start with an introduction. Um, you're all you're both familiar with the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And the very first controversy we encounter is um, that was written 10 years ago. That was the DSM-5. Um, there are several major areas of controversy about how that is structured, particularly for bipolar disorders. And perhaps the biggest area of controversy, although lately it's been diminishing and diminishing in my direction, you know, like what I've been touting for 20 years. So that's kind of gratifying, um, very gratifying. That controversy is um, categorical versus dimensional. So jargon terms meaning categorical, the DSM system. You either have it or you don't, and here are the rules by which we make that judgment. Dimensional is the jargon term for a spectrum way of thinking about it so that you could have any degree of symptoms and any mix from one extreme like plain unipolar depression to clear-cut manic depressive bipolar one that from a spe spectrum perspective, there are patients all the way along in between. You can have a little bipolarity and not be bipolar by DSM definition. So we have categorical, yes or no, you have it or you don't. It's got rules, you make the diagnosis according to the rules, or no, no, it's a spectrum. There are people in between major depression and bipolar one or bipolar two. There are people in between along a spectrum of mood where the variable is, how bipolar are you? Well, that latter way of thinking about it, the spectrum approach to diagnosis used to be really controversial. The DSM was the DSM, it's the rule book. So that's what we go by. And in fact, for your board exams, you might still have to pay attention to answering questions using a DSM framework. But in the real world, in the clinical world, you discover very quickly that there are all these people in the middle that don't reach these diagnostic criteria of bipolar disorder and yet aren't clearly unipolar either. They're in the middle. Priscilla, you might actually already have seen that just working at Cedar Hills. You will definitely see it when you're working at Unity. Gus, you'll encounter this when you get to your clinical phase next year. There are people who show up and you go, well, okay, DSM, according to DSM, this is not bipolar because it doesn't have this, this, and this. And we can, for board purposes, do a quick review of what are the DSM criteria for bipolar disorder? I won't ask you, but you'll be going, okay, let's see, I remember. Um, okay, so there's manic symptoms. You have to have a certain number of manic symptoms and you have to persist for a certain duration. So again, DSM for board purposes, that would be, what is it, four or more? Um, I can't even remember because I'm using this spectrum perspective for so long, I don't really care if it's four or three or what. Um, and how long, for mania, it's, Priscilla, you probably even remember this, for mania, it's- like, Seven, seven yes. days. Yes, and for hypomania, I think for hypomania, it's just four, right? Yeah, no, very yeah. good, exactly. So hypomania, a little, literally a little mania has a shorter duration threshold and otherwise the same symptom set for mania. The point being, okay, there's bipolar one at this end of the mood spectrum. And then bipolar two is defined by having hypomania instead of mania. 
and episodes of severe depression. So very close to bipolar one. In fact, you go, okay, well, what is the, is like there are, is there a cutoff, some sort of dividing line in between mania and hypomania? In other words, between bipolar one and bipolar two? And the answer is no, there is no cutoff in there at all. No one ever said there was. These are just arbitrary distinctions to allow you to characterize these points on a mood spectrum. Okay, so that would be the basic, um, how do we approach diagnosis in the modern age where we're not literally tied to the DSM? That okay so far? Yes. I, I haven't heard. Go ahead. Oh no, I, I was just saying I'm I'm good. <laughs> go ahead. So I I was going to ask a question about um, temporality. And um, I guess just in my very short experience as the inpatient psych elective I had, you know, trying to distinguish, oh, you know, the patient had this many symptoms or these specific symptoms for four days versus seven days, or, I mean, this is maybe slightly different, but like, you know, for schizoaffective disorder, you know, were they having psychotic symptoms simultaneously as mood symptoms? And, you know, my question is, is, how easy is it to get so fixated on numbers in DSM-5 without taking into consideration that that might be limiting us in our, like you were saying, kind of, it is a spectrum. And I feel like I've, I'm still seeing people say, oh, well, we have to make sure we're meeting this criteria. Um, I guess that's not even really a question, but I guess it's more of an observation that will one, you know, even someone that doesn't have a mental illness, you know, how are they going to remember, oh, was it four or seven, or maybe yes. a year ago, yes. I was having all of these symptoms or not having these symptoms. So I think maybe that rigidity, to a certain extent, is doing our patients a disservice. Again, not really a question, <laughs> more of a, an yeah, observation. Uh, yeah, following you close. Um, so first of all, uh, caution both to Priscilla and you, Goss. Um, how you approach this in part depends on who your attending is, who's making the final decision. And you will discover, as Priscilla already has, that there are some people who are still really operating according to the DSM. And it's either a yes or no, you either have it or you don't. And if you start talking about a spectrum, you will, hopefully they'd be open-minded enough to kind of give you their perspective, but you can almost sort of get yourself in trouble. Like, you know, you're like not a rule follower. So be a little cautious there. Hear out what you can, you know, suss out what you think is the attending's way of approaching diagnosis. So I'll bet you did exactly that when you were up there in Cedar Hills. So um, so you mentioned schizoaffective, for example, and Gus, you might remember um, there's this rule that says, uh, well, Priscilla, can you recount what is the official, um, what's the DSM for schizoaffective? So it's like to have schizoaffective disorder, you have to have a period where you have psychotic symptoms without mood symptoms, my understanding, but you have to have a period where you've had mood symptoms and psychotic symptoms. I think maybe it's like two weeks or something along those lines. But to, to me, it almost seems like though that the schizoaffective disorder is almost part of a spectrum in another way of like schizophrenia and maybe even bipolar because it has the, the mood and psychotic symptoms and then the, um, yeah, but maybe you could explain schizoaffective disorder better. I'm, I'm still grappling with understanding it for sure. Yeah, I don't need to, you just did. Because you're right, there is a spectrum between clear-cut bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. It's most evident in the genetic data where you take people who have a, a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, no one would quibble with it, it was classic bipolar one manic depressive illness. And take someone else with a clear-cut schizophrenia diagnosis, long-term slowly declining cognitive skills, um, negative symptoms, periods of psychosis, no one would quibble it with schizophrenia. You take those two people and then you look at their family histories or you get genetic data from their families. And then you look at the genetic data and you look to see do these things sort out into two different buckets. And the answer is no, 
there are people all the way along between with mixtures of the genes that seem to be associated with these two supposedly different conditions. So genetically, they're not distinct in terms of phenomenology. When you see patients like 100 patients on an inpatient unit, you'd see people with all these different variations of clearly mood-based to hardly any mood stuff at all, just psychosis and people all the way along in between. Schizoaffective from a practical point of view is basically, you know, people use it in a jargon way to refer to a middle point between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder because it has clear, it has strong characteristics of both. So in a jargon way, it's kind of a useful way to, you know, refer to this admixture, the middle point. But in that DSM way, it's kind of bizarre, like, oh, really, that's how you're going to define this? And as Priscilla, you're pointing out, who's going to remember this with enough precision to allow us to make this judgment? Um, moreover, who are we listening to here, as you have learned, and Gus, you will learn, um, when you want to get data like this, you'd be talking not to the patient, you'd be talking to their family members, because Patients are not going to, they're coming, they're in an inpatient psychiatric unit, they're manic or they're, they're psychotic. They can't give you these data, but the family might be able to. So collateral data, going for collateral data, making it out of habit when you're trying to make some of these finer distinctions. And lastly, along the spectrum way of approaching schizoaffective disorder, well, we really actually only have two kinds of treatments. So even though the phenomenon isn't binary, the treatment is. So really, it's more a matter of, are we going to go with treatment for bipolar disorder, where the emphasis is on mood, mood stability, preventing mania, preventing depression? Or are we going to go with an antipsychotic, where the target is psychosis and getting out of the psychotic phase and starting to use other tools to cope with all the rest of the things that go with schizophrenia? Well, in between, at some point, you have to make a decision. Well, are you going with this type of medication, which for bipolar disorder, the first line medication for the treatment of a manic episode, which is what makes you psychotic and makes you kind of on this differential in the first place, first line treatment for mania is now actually pretty strongly agreed on. Like the fir very first medication you ought to consider for bipolar one mania is click lithium, right? I hope that's Maybe I hope that's what you were taught. It's now very clear if you look at human guidelines for um, the International Society for Bipolar Disorders, for example, the Canadian Mood and Anxiety Treatment Network, look at their recent guidelines, it's lithium. There's another recent set of guidelines that came out of Australia and New Zealand for the Royal Society of Psychiatry of Australia and New Zealand. They have new mood guidelines, lithium numero uno for the treatment of mania. So with schizoaffective, are you going to treat with lithium or are you going to treat with an antipsychotic? But I, mean, I won't go on too much farther, but Priscilla, you've already discovered, oh, no, 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 that isn't how it works. They came in and they were psychotic. So you're going to give them lithium? Nah, you're going to give them an antipsychotic. Even if you thought it was schizoaffective, and well, certainly if you thought it was schizoaffective, but even if you thought it was bipolar one, pure classic mania causing psychosis, which it can, not just grandiose psychosis, like, you know, ridiculous grandiosity, but also paranoia and also disorganized thought process. Psychosis, you can't differentiate psychosis between bipolar and schizophrenia just by looking at the psychotic symptoms because bipolar one can do it. But mm -hmm. if it was like, Classic grandiose mania, clear, you know, clear cut family history, clear cut. This is psychosis, but the context is bipolar one. What are you going to treat with an in on an inpatient unit? Oh man, it's not lithium. It's an antipsychotic. So where does lithium come in? It comes in in outpatient land when the patient gets minute, You get them like as you were doing, Priscilla. You know, the emphasis on get them out of the hospital as quickly as possible and hand them off to somebody who to do, who's going to do the outpatient work. And then comes the consideration of lithium. Is that about what you saw? It is, and I, I actually have a, a follow-up question on that. So that's 100% aligned with my understanding that in, you know, the acute setting, you know, bipolar psychosis or other psychotic disorders, 
you would, you know, give somebody an antipsychotic and then start lithium and outpatient. Um, but there was this patient that I was following for a while, and her diagnosis was very complicated. It could have been meth-induced psychosis, you know, historical diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder, but she had a bad experience with antipsychotics in the past and only wanted natural things in her body. And since lithium is, you know, like a salt, she's like, oh, I'll take lithium. Mm-hmm. And which is really interesting because, you know, maybe there wasn't the understanding that lithium wouldn't acute you know help her acutely but she also didn't think anything was wrong which was in you know a lot of patients don't have insight but i think it's interesting to think about how patients will perceive what medications they're taking and even if maybe lithium isn't what you would usually use in the acute setting if the patient will take it you know why not it was it was just a, a connection with you talking about lithium and reminding me of that yeah, interesting. That's backwards um, from the usual pattern, but sh- sure enough, that's how it went down. So, so is that usually the standard of care? Is you want to give them an antipsychotic in the inpatient and then lithium in the outpatient, or is it necessarily you're treating more of the severe symptoms, which tend to be more of the antipsych the the like the like psychosis? Right. So, Gus, um, difference between what's ideal and what is kind of practical and has evolved in the real world. Um, and this is less so in some other countries. For example, um, in uh, Norway, it would be, um, I, I have a colleague who practices there, um, less emphasis on antipsychotics on the inpatient unit for bipolar one. Mm-hmm. Um, but here, particularly because, you know, because it's an insurance-based healthcare system, uh, the insurance companies really turn the screws hard on get that patient out of the inpatient unit. It's the most expensive setting. And so when you turn the screws hard, it's like, well, what do we? What are the symptoms that got the person into the inpatient unit? We've got to get rid of those in order to get them out. What were those? It was the psychosis. It wasn't the rest. It wasn't all the rest of the stuff that goes with having bipolar disorder. It's not going to get addressed on an inpatient unit. So it's unfortunately a sort of an artifact of our healthcare system. We, we end up with this split and we're not really following our own treatment guidelines. Um, so the treatment guidelines really think about big picture in the long run, how are you going to treat bipolar one? Not like, how are you going to treat it on an inpatient unit? I definitely forgot about the role insurance companies really have in terms of when it comes to treatment, but that that definitely makes sense now. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't want to disillusion you too much. You haven't even gotten there yet. <laughs> so uh, what we've talked about so far is a spectrum approach to diagnosis as opposed to the DSM, but I should be careful there with my language. They aren't really in opposition. You can use them both. When the patient meets criteria for the, the DSM criteria, fine, use the DSM criteria. But when it's like, well, well they don't quite make, make the cut off but they aren't that other thing either. They seem to be in the middle. Why don't we just acknowledge the fact that, yeah, there are lots of people in the middle and we're gonna have to cope with that. Since usually our treatment options are binary, it really ends up being a matter of like, how far across the spectrum do you need to go before you switch from that strategy to this strategy? And that's actually, we're gonna talk about mixed states. Mixed states is a classic example of just that. Um, to translate, you have major depression and bipolar, clear-cut bipolar one. But according to the DSM, big change in the DSM-5, 2013, they redefine a diagnosis that did exist before the DSM-5 called mixed states. But they redefined it in a major way to say mixed states can occur anywhere along this spectrum. Now, they didn't quite say it that way. They didn't say, oh, look, there's a spectrum of mood. And, you know, we've got our diagnostic, you know, this categorical system doesn't work in bipolar disorders. They didn't say that. They said, okay, in our categorical system, we'll have another category and we'll call it mixed states. And we'll say that you can have some admixture of depression and manic symptoms. And in fact, you can have a variety of admixtures and it will still be the same thing. And we'll let you use this mixed state term 
even for people with unipolar major depression, which is sort of like, wait a minute, how's that supposed to work? This is unipolar, but you can have a mixed state specifier, which you tack on to their major depression diagnosis, and you call it major depression with mixed features, which means they aren't really over here. They're over here. They have manic symptoms at the same time as their depression symptoms. So it's basically acknowledging that it really actually is a mood spectrum without saying so, without saying spectrum, without saying dimensional and sticking with your categorical system. So that's the backstory, the history of mixed states. And what we're going to talk about now is, well, how many symptoms, what symptoms, and what does that mean for treatment, which still remains largely binary? You're either going to treat with antidepressants or you're going to treat with mood stabilizers that have antidepressant effects, which is kind of a separate category that ought to have a name for it all unto itself. I'm trying to coin it, actually, in a couple of papers that I'm writing. MSAEs. You know, we got SRIs and SNRIs. Oh, we should have MSAEs, mood stabilizers with antidepressant effects, because that's what you choose from for a person who's presenting with depression, but who also has some number of manic symptoms. When do we switch from antidepressants to MSAEs is the very practical question around mixed states. So I'm going to pause in a moment, but we need to define mixed states according to the DSM first, and then we'll look at this spectrum and where do you make that decision. So you are now racking your brains for the DSM criteria for mixed state features specifier for major depression. Gosted, I wouldn't be surprised if you just never even encountered this in the stuff that they taught you in second year. Did you hear about this mixed states thing? No, I have not. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's kind of a like, it's not obscure because, well, let's see, is this an obscurity in practice? Oh, quite the opposite. Tons of people, the majority of people with depression show up with anxiety and agitation and sometimes irritability. Um, so we're not talking about some obscure thing. We're talking about like the majority of people with mood disorders have this. And, and then it didn't even get mentioned in your course. And the DSM just made this massive change in how you go about diagnosing things. <laughs> so anyway, this is a big deal in the real world. And Priscilla, you asked to talk about mixed states. You already encountered this somehow? How? Well, I had sort of heard about it. Um, I, I was, I guess it was on my elective rotation and my preceptor had just given me the big the big dsm-5 he just said go go home and look at this whatever you want to look at um and i think i i saw the mixed mood states and i were with mixed features and i didn't know anything about it like it hadn't been brought up and i have just seen the term used but i haven't seen it talked about that much like i've seen it you know in papers maybe or on a dsm-5 but it doesn't get talked about and that's why i wanted to learn more about it because I just I really don't know a lot about it right now. Interesting that you honed in on it because um, I got invited back to give a talk at the American Psychiatric Nurses Association mm -hmm. meeting. I gave a talk there last year about mixed states and they said could you come back and do that talk again because this is really important. In other words of all the things they could have a speaker come and talk about that's what they picked and I'm currently rebuilding my website that I built years ago for, by, for talking about bipolar disorders. And the guy that's helping me rebuild it, who's a psychiatrist in Argentina, um, said, oh, you don't have a new paper on a new page on mixed states. That was the very first thing he wanted me to add. So in clinical practice, this is actually maybe one of the biggest um, sort of clinical conundrums and important questions. Um, Priscilla, you already encountered the inpatient conundrum, psychosis. How bipolar is it? Do we really need to use an antipsychotic? Could we use a mood stabilizer? Outpatient, someone's going to present not with psychosis, but with depression. That's the main thing that people show up with. Um, anxiety, yes, but depression, far more so. Now, depression in the context of PTSD, depression in the context of borderlinity or Attention deficit disorder, yes, but mood is a big deal. And mood usually presents with 
this other stuff mixed in. So we're going to take two definitions of mixed states. We're going to look at the DSM, and then we're going to look at the kind of more practical approach and the more, more recent data-based approach to diagnosis of mixed states. For your board purposes, the DSM criteria for the mixed state specifier, and you can tell I'm not, I'm not really a DSM guy, so I don't hold myself to actually being able to remember these. Gus, do you remember? Have you got it in front of you already? Uh, uh, the the actual DSM? <laughs> yes. Uh, I could pull it up real quick. <laughs> yeah, you could. And you could look and you could hunt up the DSM mixed features specifier. Um, I think that's technically how it's in there. It's actually in the... It's in the unipolar section anymore. It's not in the bipolar section of the DSM, which is fascinating. They stuck this mixed feature specifier onto major depression. So okay. the rule is you got to have three or more manic symptoms in addition to your depressive symptoms. That's, I'm almost certain that's correct. Might be four, but I'm pretty sure it's three. Priscilla's looking it up. Um, and then the really controversial part is, oh, but only some manic symptoms, not others. We're going to disallow some manic symptoms because they have too much overlap with plain depression. You could have them in plain depression. It doesn't make it mixed. It's just part of plain depression. So we won't allow those. And which ones did they disallow? Anxiety, anger, agitation, psychomotor agitation, and um, distractibility, attention problems. Well, in the ensuing 10 years, there are three papers in really good journals by very well-known psychiatrists, mood disorder researchers, who've shown those four are the most common presenting features in mixed states. So the ones that the DSM disallowed are the ones that everybody thinks are the ones that we should be paying attention to. So DSM-5, you got to have three or more of these, of the manic symptoms. So like grandiosity and elation and talkativeness and hypersexuality. But these people are presenting with depression. And that's what you're going to wait for is like grandiosity plus depression. This is stupid. Actually, when you look at the data, those are the three least common in mixed states when you define them using a separate way of thinking about it. So the point, as you can see where I'm going with this, is forget the DSM criteria, except to observe that they've made a complete change in the diagnostic system to allow that there is a spectrum. It's like, how mixed are you? How much bipolarity do you have? forget the number, forget which ones, and just look at it this way. How many manic symptoms do you have? One, two, three, four. It can be any ones, but the most common ones would be what's been called um, by a, a bipolar researcher in Toronto, uh, Canada, um, the four A's. Anxiety, anger, agitation, and attention problems. Anxiety, anger, agitation, meaning psychomotor overactivity, and attention problems. Well, if you take those four, we'll talk in a minute about the clinical implications of, of using those four in particular and what that does to diagnosis. But it, at minimum, it says, okay, how many manic symptoms are we going to count? I don't care. Any of them count. One, two, three, I'm paying attention to whatever the number is. And which manic symptoms count? I don't care. I'm paying attention to them all, including probably the, these four in particular are going to be the ones that really pop my ears forward. Although, you know, elation and hypersexuality in the context of somebody who is really depressed, yeah, that, that would cock my ears forward too. All right. Does that make sense so far? We got two ways of looking at it, DSM way and the new way. Yes. Okay. Well, now for the big problem. Um, to help this stick in your head, I'm going to share screen. Can I share screen? Um, Priscilla, can you set me up to um, do that? Yes, let me see. I can make you a co-host, oh, and that should let you do it. 
co-host. Okay, try it yeah. now. Yeah, good. So these are my slides for that American Psychiatric Nurse Practitioners Association meeting, their national meeting this coming June. And I had to send my slides in already. Um, and here's the one I want to show you. The symptom criteria for when you combine depression with PTSD, depression with generalized anxiety disorder, depression with, is this person borderline? Depression with attention deficit disorder. Look at the overlap in symptoms. It's huge. I mean, like, this is a fool's errand trying to separate out comorbid PTSD and depression, comorbid GAD and depression versus a mixed state. You'd think we're, must, we're probably talking about the same animal here. Wouldn't you think that? But you will see, and gosh, I, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm just setting you up for like, oh my God, am I going into the right field? Because our field is the most fascinating. It has the most open questions. It has the most opportunity to really use your head as well as your, the whole rest of you, your heart and every the, part of the rest of your body in practice every day. I can't imagine going into anything else because every day is exciting is never boring, it's super challenging, and the literature is so growing so fast, it's fascinating all the time. You just wanna look in your journals every month and go, oh, what's the, what's the cool new stuff this month? So don't let me hear you otherwise. <laughs> uh, no, no, I actually appreciate the insight because you know, um, when you learn something in school, you know, like this is how they say it is, but I know just uh, in reality, that's just not, how it actually is. So I really appreciate you kind of giving me a head start of like, it, it doesn't always present this way. So just FYI. <laughs> All right. So what we're going to do now then is, um, stop my screen here, is, well, okay, look at the overlap. How are you supposed to cope with this clinically? The patients coming in to see you on an outpatient basis are coming in with depression and agitation and anxiety and anger and, um, and are, is this a mixed state or is this depression and plus PTSD? Oh, well, do they have a trauma history? Well, yeah, they got a trauma history. Nearly everybody's got a trauma history. And that isn't just nowadays. It's the people who come in to see a psychiatrist. That selects for people with having a trauma history to the point where the residents in Samaritan's residency program and I just have multiple times joked about like, oh, wow, you saw somebody without a trauma history? Really like, oh my God, what the, this is like a major event. The other day it was, oh wow, you saw somebody who'd never had a psychiatric medication of any kind ever before and you got to see them first? That is almost unheard of. So we in psychiatry see, see the complex people, which means comorbidities are the norm is it comorbidities or is it just like the reality is people get depression and they get these other things, those four things. Anxiety, I'm, I'm practicing doing this in the same direct, in the same order every time to make them more memorable because I'm practicing for other publication. Anxiety, anger, agitation, and attention problems. Almost deliberately framed not only to be the four A's, but to demonstrate their overlap with anxiety. Well, is it depression plus generalized anxiety disorder or is it a mixed state? Anger, is it depression plus attention deficit disorder where you have irritability as a feature and attention problems? Um, is it, or like borderlinity where people can be so furiously angry with you like borderline personality disorder, unfortunate diagnosis, but there it is. Um, or is it agitation? Is this a side effect like antidepressants can cause akathisia? Akathisia is psychomotor overactivation. Is this like, oh, this antidepressant that you recently st started on, and antidepressants are known to cause mixed states. So is this a mixed state? Or is this your antidepressant is causing some akathisia? Ah, too bad, it's a side effect here. Let's give you a beta blocker and see if we can damp that down a little bit. 
That is a huge clinical decision to make. Are you going to blame the antidepressant that you started or are you going to cover it up? And are you covering up something that you really ought to be treating in some other way? So obviously you can tell the energy I got here. This is a super common clinical problem. It is probably the most common thing you'd encounter on an outpatient basis. And you even will see it on an inpatient unit where people come in and PTSD is clear. Anxiety is through the roof. Agitation is already there. Anger kind of maybe what helped them get hospitalized in the first place. And they have a history of mood stuff. Well, is this bipolar disorder presenting with a really severe mixed state, which it easily could? Or is this, you know, PTSD plus depression, in which case you're going to treat it very differently? So now I'll calm down a little bit and we'll look at how are the treatments going to differ if you define it as, um, let's see if I get my hands right. This is the bipolar end. So is this a mixed state? So there's depression with mixed state in it. What would you do if you, if it was really clearly obvious that this is bipolar depression with all these mixed features versus how are you going to treat it if it's plain old unipolar and it's maybe got a little anger in there, irritable major depression. How would you treat this versus how would you treat that? Are we ready to go there? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, let's see. What's the most common way that unipolar major depression is treated? Simple. Like SSRIs so, right. or antidepressants. Yeah. Yes. And, and SRI, you're right, is probably the most common. And who is going to be prescribing that most commonly? Could even be a PCP or, or a psychiatrist, but sometimes primary care. Yeah. So who prescribes, who, who are the most prevalent prescribers of antidepressants in the United States? By far, it's the PCPs. That's why we as psychiatrists rarely see someone who's never had a psychotropic medication because the PCPs, well, they can't refer people to psychiatry because there aren't enough psychiatrists. So yet another great reason to go into psychiatry, man, you can write your ticket where do you want to go and get paid plenty of money because there aren't enough of us out there. So that's cool. And it's not like the numbers are growing. They're actually shrinking even while you're now going into psychiatry. So you are really going in the right direction. I think that's a very good plan to go and become a psychiatrist. All right. So um, PCPs are going to prescribe those antidepressants most commonly. So I have to loop back at the very end of this because it isn't like you are going to get to make a choice between an antidepressant and a mood stabilizer with antidepressant effects. They're already going to be on an antidepressant, which can cause a mixed state. So now you're going to have to contend with the possibility that that's the problem or part of the problem, and you can't just ignore it. Are you going to put something on top of it? Are you going to get rid of it? How are you going to do that? We'll come back to that. If you had the choice of a antidepressant or a mood stabilizer with antidepressant effects, it's really just a matter of how many mixed symptoms can a person have before this becomes a better idea than that, right? All right, answer, nobody knows. Really? For the most common presentation in psychiatry, how can that be? Answer, oh, we didn't even have this diagnosis until 10 years ago. And it took five years after the GSM for people to start going, oh, wow, what are we gonna do with this mixed state thing here? Um, and even now the GSM is relatively rigid about who's got it and who doesn't. So all these people who are in the middle who have depression plus anxiety, anger, agitation, and attention problems, they're not being studied because we don't have a DSM label that everybody agrees upon for them. It's a huge gaping hole in our current, what are, we, what are we doing as clinicians? So we have to kind of make up an answer. We have to go, well, all right, on the basis of our best current working understanding, what is the answer to this question? And the answer is, in my view, it doesn't take much before you start thinking like that instead of like that. Because for one thing, 
there's our first rule of medicine, do no harm. Well, antidepressants can cause mixed states and make mixed states worse. That tilts the scale in this direction, in my view. In fact, <laughs> tilts it like this. You know, it's like we're really rolling downhill toward these mood stabilizers with antidepressant effects. So anger. Mm, now maybe, well, so so anger or anxiety. Each one of these would be like, yeah, I'm I'm worried. I'm starting to think like this. Well, that isn't enough for most people because what's more stigmatizing? Depression or bipolar disorder? You know the answer to that one. People do not like this label, right? So if you invoke the bipolar word for someone who's like right there, it freaks people out. Oh, I don't have that. I know what that is. That's like manic depressive, right? Mania, I don't have any of that. And now they're looking at you like, you don't know what you're talking about. So you just blew the ball game if you don't have that confidence. Because you, you can't spend your time in your office explaining, well, you know, so there's this DSM rules thing, but no, it's really actually, no, 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 no. All this yakety yak that I've just been doing for the last 30 minutes, it's hard to give that patient education background for this kind of a decision. But that's, I think, what you need to do. Because otherwise, you've got to have buy-in. You've got to have consensus on what is the basis for the choice that we're about to make? And if the basis of it is how mixed are you, then you need your patient to understand that there is such a thing as mixed. And we're going to decide how mixed are you. And on that basis, we will decide whether to do this or that. But lastly, before I yak on too long, um, look at the side effects and risks of antidepressants and look at the side effects and risks of these mood stabilizers with antidepressant effects because it helps you make this decision. So let's now think, and I'll invite you, Gus and Priscilla, and subsequent attendees perhaps, to like make a list in your head of not just what have you learned are the side effects of these things, and I'll tell you in a minute, what are we talking about over here, mood stabilizers with antidepressant effects, but what do you tell patients about these risks? You don't tell them everything you ever learned. You tell them selective things. So what selective things would you tell people about antidepressants? And what selective things would you tell people about these things? Now, I'm just to keep you engaged here with me, um, I'm going to invite you, Gus, and Priscilla to guess um, what, what goes on this list. What are mood stabilizers with antidepressant effects? There's four of them in most people's book. Uh, Valproic acid? Is a mood stabilizer. We'll talk about whether it goes on this list or not in a second. Correct. Mood stabilizer, yes. Um, what about like uh, lamictal or lamotrigine? Lamotrigine. So we're going to compare lamotrigine and divalproex, um, depicote, um, or valproid, um, in the form of the in if it's in, in its divalproex form. Okay, lamotrigine, maybe divalproex. Um, topiramate, maybe, or carbamazepine. Yeah. Uh, two more anticonvulsants. Carbamazepine, very clear mood stabilizer effects. Topiramate, people have wanted it to have mood stabilizer effects for a really long time because it causes weight loss. It also causes cognitive impairment like for nearly everybody. So not very practical, certainly not practical as a weight loss agent, but tempting if it was a mood stabilizer. Nah, nope, sorry, we don't have the data to support that. So we'll throw that one out. What is... Phelps's favorite mood stabilizer. Oh, lithium. Yes, okay. So lithium has antidepressant effects and it's a mood stabilizer, okay? Moreover, lithium has anti-suicide effects. Ooh, special bonus. All right. Um, we have now, now <laughs> you might be phobically avoiding the antipsychotics because you know that Phelps is an anti antipsychotic guy because they have all sorts of nasty side effects, long-term and even short-term, and that is all true, but two of them would go on the list of mood stabilizers with antidepressant effects in nearly everybody's book. Is there an antipsychotic that clearly has an antidepressant effect? Um, I'm just gonna guess, Zeprazidil? No, Seroquel, Seroquel? is it Quetiapine? Yeah, Quetiapine. 
I wouldn't expect you to know it, but that's a good guess. And maybe you once saw this somewhere. There is a, a series of randomized trials in bipolar depression for quetiapine versus placebo. Mm -hmm. Lambda. Mm -hmm. Really good evidence for efficacy. So quetiapine, I shy away from it. On the, It's on this list, but I shy away from it, not because of its lack of evidence for efficacy, slam dunk evidence for efficacy, but because it has other problems. You may have seen already people either getting on quetiapine or they've been on quetiapine or you've looked at the list and anything come to mind for side effects for quetiapine? Weight gain, sedation, um, it's like metabolic effects. Yeah, those are the big three. Perfect. So if you lump weight gain and metabolic because it's the same phenomenon, it's doing something really weird to the way people do metabolism, particularly of carbohydrates, um, and sedation. It is so sedating, it is a knockout drop, but you can use that to advantage because lots of times we're treating something when people don't sleep, right? Um, like mania. So it would be really nice to make sure that they sleep. So quetiapine as an anti-manic, yeah, a big strength there. Sometimes people with their depression have terrible insomnia and a big time sleeper would be very handy. So quetiapine, if you just give it at night, you know, about 20 minutes later, you are going down. But when you're trying to get up in the morning, yeah, people say I'm a little slow until I've had a cup of coffee. I'm not worth much. But after that, I'm fine during the day. So daytime sedation did not happen with quetiapine if it dosed properly. Always all at night, always immediate, not um, always immediate release, never extended release. There's no point in extended release. Why did anybody ever make it? because they extended their patent on the drug. Okay, so we got lamotrigine, lithium, quetiapine, and then there's this new guy, lorazidone. Um, what is the, I can't even remember the trade name for lorazidone. Um, Latuda. Thank you, exactly. Um, just went generic. So it finally makes my list. Up until that, it was like, well, I don't care. It's so much more expensive than everything else. Why would you put it on the list? But now it's there. And it does have clear-cut antidepressant effects in a randomized trial, very much like quetiapine's data. So mood stabilizers, mood stabilizers with antidepressant effects, these are the four, versus antidepressants. Now we're going to think about um, the risk profile of antidepressants versus the risk profile of Let's take kind of like, say, lamotrigine and quetiapine. Since we already looked at the big risks for quetiapine, we'll look at the big risks for lamotrigine and the big risks, the kinds of things that you would tell patients about for antidepressants. All right. Priscilla, you want to give me a go at what would you tell patients uh, who are going to start an antidepressant, any SRI you pick? Uh, well, they could have some GI side effects like diarrhea, maybe loss of libido. That's pretty common. Um, yeah, those are those are the most common ones that I've yeah, yeah. that I've heard. Good, agree. Um, and it kind of depends on which one you pick, you know. So sertraline, for example, uh, Zoloft. Um, maybe nausea is a little potentially more prominent. Um, maybe not oh, much, like not insomnia much. as well. Yeah, yeah, what? insomnia would be, definitely be on the list as a possible side effect. Um, in part, I'm, I'm using the two of you. I've set you up because I wanted to see if you would name the really controversial ones that have emerged just recently. Oh, I've heard very recently, because you just said this, I've, I've heard that it can cause anxiety. Like antidepressants can cause like a feeling of agitation. Maybe it's specific ones, but... Maybe that's what you were getting at earlier with that certain antidepressants can lead to or exacerbate a mixed mood state. But I don't know if it depends on which ant antidepressant it is. Uh, good. So yes, antidepressants can cause anxiety, just anxiety. Just people feel like you know, their mind is going too fast and thinking of these negative things that they're, they're worrying about this, that, and the other thing. Definitely could do that. Is that a mixed state? Uh, it's kind of a definition problem, you know? It's like, well, it certainly sounds like it. Um, on the other hand, sometimes, and the primary care providers would tell you this, you know, sometimes when people start their antidepressant, they get a little revved up. 
And if you just stick with it for a couple of weeks, that goes away and then people can have these great responses. I hardly ever get to see that with my own eyes because I don't get to prescribe antidepressants de novo, like for the first time that anyone's ever seen a psychotropic. But they do, and that's what they say. So they wouldn't necessarily stop an antidepressant when people are getting a little wired um, because they have seen that that can just go away. So it isn't always the beginning of a mixed state, but sometimes it is. Would and you say that's more common with like SSRIs rather than any other antidepressants? Well, so we got SRIs and then the main alternatives would be, well, there's SNRIs, which you should almost never use because they have the biggest likelihood of one other problem we haven't gotten to yet. But then we also have mirtazapine, um, Remeron, which is sort of like quetiapine. It's like very likely to help you sleep. It's histaminergic. It's actually like Benadryl plus an antidepressant. Um, and so people get a sleep benefit from it. Great. Uh, there's a side effect that goes with mirtazapine. Heard of that one? No, oh, doesn't it make people hungry? Yeah, weight gain. Yeah. So it's such a big problem with mirtazapine. You'd think that with mirtazapine would like, that would be great, but it's actually so bad that we try not to use it or I, I try not to use it. Again, it's like first do no harm principle. But then there's one more, again, Gus thinking about things other than SRIs. The one more is one that in an editorial years ago in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, pretty prominent place, this team of people wrote a commentary and said, why isn't bupropion the most widely prescribed antidepressant? Bupropion, well, butrin. Why isn't it the number one, they said? Because all those things that Priscilla just named, it doesn't do it. It doesn't cause sexual dysfunction, which the SRI is due to the tune of uh, about what percentage of people get sexual dysfunction Hey, your medical students, you know, it's either 80 or 20 or 50, right? Right. <laughs> it's 50. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So very, very common problem. Well, it depends on how you ask. If you ask informally, you get 10, maybe 15%. But if you ask in a questionnaire that's designed to give people the feeling of anonymity and safety, then it comes up to more like 50%. Okay, so bupropion does not cause sexual dysfunction. Bupropion does not cause weight gain, which the SRIs can, not big time like the antipsychotics, but it, they do it. Um, and bupropion does not cause severe withdrawal problems, as do the SRIs, and most of all, the SNRIs. Severe withdrawal problems. So you've heard about this, that people, when they're stopping an antidepressant can have withdrawal, they can have physical symptoms like, you know, nausea and dizziness and brain zaps and feeling kind of wired and maybe mood instability. Um, they can also have stuff that sounds just like a mixed state, agitation, anxiety, anger, and attention problems. So I think there's a similarity between mixed states and withdrawal, but it's all another subject. Um, suffice to say, we're looking at what do you tell patients when you're going to prescribe an antidepressant? And it, to some degree, depends on which antidepressant. But there's one thing that you got to tell everybody, even those who are going to go on bupropion, and that is this can cause severe withdrawal problems when you try to stop it. That mm -hmm. one didn't make the list for either of you because you haven't been prescribing these things and you're too busy in medical school to attend to the rest of the noise out there, which is there is huge noise about antidepressants doing this bad thing to people. So the question is, well, how many people are we talking about? Like 1% or 20%? Is it one in five or one in a hundred who have severe withdrawal problems? Severe to the tune of can't function, can't work, can't take care of your family, can't go to school, like really not functional severe withdrawal problems due to all of this physical and emotional stuff. 1% or 20%, 1 in 100 or 1 in 5? And the answer is, we don't know. What? 
the most widely prescribed psychotropic that we've been using for 30 years, like fluoxetine or sertraline, and we don't know the frequency of the most severe side effect. This is like discovering tardive dyskinesia after we've been using antipsychotics for quite a while. This is a, um, well, you can hear it in my voice, an utter embarrassment to our field and a really bad thing for our credibility that we didn't know about this and make more noise about this until very, very recently. So recently that the two of you hadn't heard it enough to put it on your list, but it's on your list now and it ought to be on everybody's list because we are looking really bad for not having made a big deal of this before now. Um, pausing briefly on and getting off my soapbox for you to comment or question. So uh, why would you say the reason why it took so long for it to really come to the surface? Uh, the most conspiratorial of the anti-psychiatry gang would say that it was a deliberate conspiracy on the part of the pharmaceutical industry and their spokespeople, academic psychiatrists whom they pay lots and lots of money in the form of honoraria and consultancies um, that's the most conspiratorial answer. Makes sense. <laughs> there's an element of truth in that. It may not, it isn't the whole truth, but there's a big element in there, which is very embarrassing. I guess that was kind of just making me think about how, I, well, I wasn't around when SSRIs first became this huge thing in psychiatry. Um, but it seemed like people thought, oh, SSRIs are going to save everybody, you know, and I think maybe partially because of that, maybe people wanted to kind of turn a blind, blind eye to some of these potential downsides. And it's, it seems like so many people, they just, they want, you know, Prozac, that's what they think is going to help them. Um, even when I say people, I mean, patients coming in with depression or anxiety or whatever, and to hear, oh, well, maybe it's not the best idea. I think that would kind of go against so much of what society has been telling patients and also, you know, psychiatrists and those in the medical community. So I think that knowledge forces us to completely shift our framework of a huge class of medications. And that's very distressing to do. Um, and I'm not saying that makes it okay, but I'm thinking maybe that's a, a piece of it too is that you know we maybe don't want to find fault with this you know huge amazing thing that is helping all these people that you know medicine has accomplished. Uh, Priscilla, that's really insightful and very well put, and is making me think. Um, when you get ready to apply for a residency program, make sure you contact me so I can write a letter of recommendation for you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> because yeah, that was yeah, you're right on there. Um, you, it's hard for us to change gears from and from something that we've been at least tacitly endorsing all this time, and now start talking about its downsides in a louder voice, especially when we don't have the data for like, well, are we talking about one in a hundred or one in twenty? Um, on the other hand, one in a hundred for a severe like basically incapacitating problem when you're stopping it. Um, we talk about lamotrigine and its risk of causing Stevens-Johnson and other allergic reactions when it's one in a thousand. Like that's really, you know, we need to tell people about that because it's a one in a thousand risk. Although, you know, I think I'd rather have antidepressant withdrawal than Stevens-Johnson syndrome, that's true. Um, in any case, uh, you're right, good point. So where I was going was, you know, in the old days, it was easy to go, oh, antidepressants, well, you know, maybe some nausea, um, maybe even some sexual side effects, maybe some insomnia, but that's kind of it. And that's what we would tell people versus lamotrigine, one in a thousand risk of Stevens John syndrome, let alone lithium. Oh, well, you know, we need to check your kidney function and watch out for your thyroid function, let alone quetiapine weight gain, like, boy, I mean, you, once you say that, we're in a different world in terms of people's appraisal of the risk, the risks that they want to take on, right? So in the old days, I think the scales used to be tipped this way, 
like rolling downhill in the direction of antidepressants when you're trying to make this choice. Whereas now, I think we actually, in my head anyway, we really ought to tip it at least back to even, if not the other way. Because from my point of view, a one in a thousand risk, it's actually closer to one in 2000 for lamotrigine causing a severe allergic reaction versus the risks that antidepressants pose. It really is, this is lower risk than that. Which means if we don't know how we're, you know, how mixed are you? We ought to be leaning in this direction, not that direction. I definitely think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and like you had said earlier too, it, it, I think patient buy-in is a big part of it. And I think, you know, it's on us as, you know, Goss and I as future psychiatric physicians to learn how to educate patients and kind of undo some of that negative societal information about medications like lithium and, you know, the mood stabilizers. And it might be more difficult to do that, but I think it, especially from what you're saying, in the long term, it's going to have the most, most benefit. Yeah. So patient education, I'm, I'm distracting myself momentarily while I go pull up, I'm going to do a little blatant self-promotion. Um, actually, it isn't quite personal self-promotion. Um, so I'm going to show you quickly and, and actually your feedback would be helpful. Um, so I'm rebuilding this website that I built 23 years ago in 2000, when I found myself explaining, oh, you know, there's this bipolar two thing. See, cause bipolar two was, didn't even exist until the DSM four, which is 1994. Um, so by 2000, I was explaining to primary care providers and patients, what is bipolar two? What is hypomania? Like over and over again. And I thought, you know, if I wrote this down once and stuck it up on the internet, then I could just refer people to these descriptions because it takes a while to parse it all out. And then they can see the references. So look, this isn't me. This is mood specialists around the world are talking like this. So I built this website and then um, I just didn't do much within the last five years and it was kind of falling into disrepair. Well, I'm now in somewhat more retirement, I'm rebuilding it. So can I still share screen? I think you should be able to. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the rebuilt version of psych education. Um, so wouldn't it be cool to have like a Wikipedia of um, all things psychiatry? Like, so as a patient or a family member, you could go and start it with any one of these boxes and get a thorough education in plain kitchen table English. Um, and so I'm gonna take you, anxiety is not built yet, but depression is, so I'm gonna take you there. And this is like the patient education that I would want somebody to get when they show up in primary care and no one has the time to do what we're now gonna do. So you can go here and it's still being built, so I haven't finished all this, but we're gonna go look. There are four main kinds of depression and you can have these three different ways of approaching it. And after you've heard about that, we're gonna go straight to any one of these, but let's go here. And it treatment depends on what kind you have because antidepressants are okay for some kinds, but they can mother make it other kinds worse. What I was just talking about basically. And so we'll give you this shtick about the four kinds of depression and then summarize them for you and then let you choose where you wanna go. But mainly what I want you to do is take this mood questionnaire. It's called Mood Check. And this is a work in progress, but ultimately we'll have a print, uh, electronic version of this now printable version. And when you get to the end, we'll help you interpret your Mood Check scores so that you can decide whether you need to learn more about mood swings without mania where we define this whole mood spectrum in the presence of all these people in between. Anyway, you get the idea. That's what I want to do for patient education is take it all out of the office. People need time to do this. They need team time to see it, think through it, maybe read some references, or maybe there's, there'll be a video version of every single one of those pages. So, because, you know, people don't read nowadays, they want to see a YouTube video. Okay, here, here's a little five minute video or less on each one of those pages. So that's what I'm working on now. 
I really like the visuals. Um, I was just noting that I mean, you were saying for people that don't read a lot, but I mean, for me, just thinking about studying when I'm doing a practice question, I don't remember paragraph, but I'll remember a visual. So I think that will be especially helpful for people. Okay, good. You're going to remember me doing this, the four <laughs> A's, anxiety, anger, agitation, agitation attention. and attention problems. You're going to be, remember me doing, Gus, you'll remember this as the mood spectrum from unipolar to bipolar. Yes. Because Priscilla had already seen it before. And you're both going to remember me going like this <laughs> versus like this. Definitely. From mood stabilizers with antidepressant effects to antidepressants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's great that you're making the website and it's, and it's very easy for, let's say, patients to, you know, absorb them. It's like, I think an informed patient is down the line, a healthy patient, because uh, the more they're informed about their condition, uh, it's much easier to work with them because I kind of think of it more as a partnership rather than, you know, a subordinate, so to speak. So. Indeed. Yeah. But, Although interestingly, it didn't used to be like that. Um, it's great that you're coming into the field to help move it in this direction. There's even a jargon term for this. It's called shared decision-making as an acronym, SDM. Um, SDM includes the use, use of PDAs, patient, patient decision uh, assistance or patient decision, something or other, PDA. Um, my website is a massive PDA, like to help in shared decision-making. One of the reasons I'm doing this is because I'm old enough now to think about prostate cancer and prostate enlargement. And could you have a, um, a prostate screening exam? What is that? I um, There's a oh, test the for it. PSA. Yeah, yeah. Should I have a PSA? What if my PSA is positive? Does that take me on to getting a biopsy? And then the biopsy is this and that. And Am I going to end up with surgery? How do I need the surgery? Might I die of something else before I die of prostate cancer? There's a pretty big, complicated story around that. And the older you get, the more relevant it becomes to the point where maybe you don't want to get a PSA at all. It'll just cause trouble. And there are some PDAs for that that people have made. And some of them are quite elaborate with videos of people, you know, this is what the surgery looks like, um, but nothing like that in psychiatry. So. I'm showing you an example of mine, and I hope that both of you come along and make more. Or you can come and help me build out the rest of that website that you saw. Absolutely. <laughs> well, this has been a really fun discussion. I I love talking about psychiatry and Dr. Phelps. You're always just such a, a fun person to talk with. Um, and I really appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise and also all you do for patients. I even in retirement, you're still finding new ways to help people, help patients and help our community. Um, so if there are any last questions or any last thoughts you had to say, otherwise this has been, this has been wonderful. You're very welcome. <laughs> I, yeah, and I also thank you for uh, taking the time to educate